I'm Tom Johnson, Thomas Johnson Antique Furniture Restoration in Gorm, Maine. Ideally, I'd like to put up a new video every two weeks, but that's harder than it sounds. You know, I like to take the time to do as good a job as I can, and it takes time to videograph that detailed work. For this week, we've stitched together a compilation of my videos on mid-century modern furniture, which are always very popular. And I'll be back again in two weeks with new content. Truly, I appreciate your support. Enjoy the show. Ella, let's watch the show now. I'm Tom Johnson, Thomas Johnson, Antique Furniture Restoration in Gore, Maine. This is a really nice set of Hans Wegener Model W2 chairs. Uh, the customer has six of them. We only have four here in the shop now. Her parents bought these in the early 1950s. They're in 100% original condition. They need to be re-glued, which is why they're here. Uh, I'll do that. I'm also going to restore the finish somewhat with some oil and wax and also uh, attempt to restore these leather seats. We want to save these seats, but they don't come off of here. The, the, the seat frame appears to be structural. I can, I can see uh, definitely a tenon in here from this piece into here. I'm a little bit unsure what's going on, but I think what I'll do, I'm going to start by loosening the cambric and then the leather, and then see what I've got here. Um, boy, I was so intent on seeing if I could get this apart. I didn't mark anything yet, so uh, now's the time to do that. Yeah, I thought I felt some looseness there. This is starting to come apart. So this back assembly doesn't seem to have any movement in it. I see maybe a little movement here in the crest rail. I might just give it a few sharp wax to see if it'll loosen up a little bit. Sometimes on chairs much older than this, they seem tight, but one or two sharp kind of wax can shock the joint loose. I'm going to do this here just to, to see. I'm not going to try too hard. No, this seems really solid, so I think I'm good. I'm going to now uh, clean all these glue joints, the tenons and the voices, and um, glue the chair back together.
Okay, these have dried overnight. Next step is to uh, restaple the leather covering. And uh, actually, before I staple the material, this piece of plywood on the bottom uh, needs to be nailed down. Okay, so now I'm going to wash the chair. Uh, I want to give it a real gentle wash. I'm going to use some uh, oil soap and a uh, gray scrubbing pad. I mixed up some fresh oil soap and I'm going to uh, clean the seats. I don't want to get them the seat real wet, so I'm just squeezing this out. All right, now I'm going to let this uh, dry for a few hours and then I'll tackle the seat. So this is dried. I'm going to take some black dye stain and uh, put it on a rag and pat it over these areas where there's a uh, raw leather shell. Okay, this is a fast drying stain, like 45 minutes, but I'm gonna let this dry for a few hours. Okay, I think the stain is dried, and now I'm going to take a paper towel and some alcohol and just uh, pat off any excess. All right, I've let this dry overnight. I don't think I needed to let it dry overnight, but it did. I'm going to take a clean paper towel and just wipe this. I want to know if there's any stain or anything left on here, but that looks nice and clean. And so now I'm going to use this leather conditioner on it. You know, I showed these to an upholsterer. He told me that this leather is actually uh, painted, which seems kind of strange. I'm not sure, though, how much good the conditioner will do on a painted surface, but I think it will help. And at the very most, I'm going to work it down well into all these cracks and, you know, try to get some, well, I will get some conditioner into that. I'm really surprised that the uh, rag with the conditioner is picking up this black. I don't know if it's, especially after I went over it with alcohol and let it dry overnight and a dry rag. I'm not too concerned about it. It could be black from the black paint that's on here. But the conditioner looks good. The directions say to let dry for a few minutes. I'll let it dry longer than that, an hour or something. And then we'll uh, start on the wood. Okay, the first thing I'm going to do now, as far as the wood is concerned, is I'm going to sand it with some just some 220 paper. 
and really lightly, just, just sort of going over it. It feels really smooth, but this will make it a little smoother. Looking if there's anything else that I need to do, I don't think so. Now I'm going to use my uh, my tongue oil varnish. I'm not jarred here from the last time I used it, and I'm going to apply it with a uh, some four zero steel wool, and then pat it off. All right, now I've gone over the whole chair. I'm going to make my rag into a pad and just kind of pad this off. I don't want to wipe it all the way off, but I'm going to just pad it. This coat looks good. I'm just going to let it dry overnight and tomorrow uh, decide if it needs another coat or not. It, it may or may not. I'll find out tomorrow. Boy, it feels great, but uh, the crest rail's a little dull. Uh, actually, parts of it have a nice sheen, other parts it's, uh, it's really soaked in. I definitely need to uh, pat on another coat. The uh, end grain on the top of these legs is really soaking it in, so I'm actually going to brush a little bit on those just to help it along. I'll let that coat dry overnight. These have soaked it up so much, uh, and I've missed a few spots here and there with the rag, that I'm going to brush on this coat, and then maybe tomorrow I'll rub it down just with steel wool and wax. Let's see what it looks like tomorrow. Okay, I've let these chairs dry for actually three days. But the coat went down really well. They certainly have enough finish on them now. In fact, they're, they're too shiny looking. It makes it look like there's a thick finish on it. Uh, but what I've got to do is cut down this sheen. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try this uh, sanding lightly with 320 gold paper and then uh, rubbing it down with a balloon pad. So what I'm doing is rubbing it with this maroon pad until it looks nice and even, until most of the shininess and the grain is gone. Not all of it because it's open grain. This is good. And then I'm going to take this uh, shop towel and just buff it out. Well, it certainly feels uh, smooth. Uh, I'm going to take my uh, beeswax polish <coughs> rag and just uh, go over just this crest rail. I'm going to see what it looks like when it's waxed. All right, now I'll uh, use a paper towel. Well, I think that looks uh, good. I think it looks just uh, the way we want it to look. Well, this looks so good, I'm just going to uh, proceed now with the rest of the chair. All right, so I'll let this dry. Uh, 
this beeswax polish. I'll let this dry for uh, you know a half hour or so, and then I'll uh, buff this out. So there we have it. These are uh, Hans Wegner Model W2 chairs. These are four of a set of six. Uh, these chairs were purchased in the mid 50s by the owner's parents. They were came in in 100% uh, original condition, uh, but they desperately needed to be re-glued. And so the only thing that's new on them now, we have new glue and a new coat of oil. I think they look pretty good. I'm Tom Johnson, Thomas Johnson, Antique Furniture Restoration, in Gorm, Maine. I've been to some thrift stores. As usual, there's a good mid-century modern uh, objects to be found. This is a really nice teak tray. It's designed by Jens Quitzgard, uh, manufactured by Dansk in the late 50s or early 60s, and it's in really, really good condition. Just needs to be cleaned up a bit. These are two really nice pieces of Coben style enamelware. They're also designed by Quiskard, and really they're in fine shape except for the handles here. And this cute little table is designed by the Eames, uh, manufactured by Herman Miller, and uh, the wire base seems fine. Uh, I got to figure out what I can do about this top. I think the first thing I'm going to do is start with these handles because they're going to need a few days of finishing. They look really bad. My guess is is that uh, these were put in the dishwasher probably a lot of times. Uh, so I'll start by sanding and then I'll probably treat them with some oxalic acid. It's funny on this larger pot the handle was just kind of wedged in there, someone had put fabric in there. And there's a little spike in there, but the smaller one just uh, screwed right off. And it has a threaded rod, you know, a threaded screw in the handle. I can't imagine what would have happened or what happened to this one. There's still something in there now. I may have uh, forgotten to mention I'm sanding with a hundred grit paper. That grayness sanded off pretty quickly, but still, I'm going to treat these with oxalic acid because I can still see grayness deep into the grain. And oxalic acid is really good at taking out uh, water stains. It kind of depends on the wood, but uh, we'll see if it works on these. Now I've heated up water in the kettle this time, uh, as opposed to hot tap water because I want to mix up a strong solution. I want to mix a couple of ounces of uh, oxalic in eight ounces of water, which is a pretty strong solution. I'll, uh, I'll let those dry completely. So I'm just uh, coming in the shop after dinner to give these a quick rinse. And you can see how much better the color is now. Okay, these have uh, dried overnight. Now I'm going to sand them uh, as well as I can with 150 and then 220.
All right, I've done the 150, and now I'm going to sand really well with 220. Uh, it's important, you know, because I'm sanding cross grain because it's a turning. It's not getting stained or anything, but uh, I want to sand it really well with 220. I don't want there to be any sanding marks on these. All right, I think that's good with the 220. Now I'll apply the first coat of finish. And I'm going to uh, finish these with the tongue oil varnish. I think that's going to be a great finish for these. It'll work well in a kitchen environment. Now these handles are of course uh, end grain, so the finish really soaks in. So I'll go back and apply a little more finish. I want this first coat to uh, really penetrate, and especially here, the very top of the handle where, where it really is end grain. And I'll come back and check this uh, every few, few minutes or so for 10 or 15 minutes and kind of keep applying it. All right, these have dried now for a couple of days and uh, you know they feel a little sort of fuzzy. So the next step I'm going to do, I'm going to apply another coat but I'm going to wet sand it. Uh, that's usually uh, reserved for like oil finishes and although this is a varnish, a tongue oil varnish, I'm treating it like an oil finish. So I'm going to take 600 black sandpaper and uh, dip it in the varnish and sand these knobs with it. Alright, now I will wipe this coat off, but just real gently. Alright, so now to this table. And this is a tough one. This is a laminate top. It's all scratched up very badly. I'm not quite sure what I should do about that. But I have noticed there's some delamination occurring here at the, on the bottom most level. So I think I should take the base off and uh, glue this down first. And while I'm doing that, I'll be thinking about what we can do to the top. So I've discovered that this bottom piece of laminate, it's loose all the way around on the edges. So I've, um, I've cut a piece of MDF, medium density fiberboard, which I'll use on the bottom here. And I think I'm going to use, a pot, since the laminate you know, is non-porous material, I think I'll use uh, epoxy under there. And I'll clamp it down using this. I do have the issue of the label. I poked around the label a little bit. I don't think it wants to come off. Uh, I'm going to cut a hole in the MDF to go over it. Also, I'm going to cover the edges of the MDF with some plastic packing tape so it won't stick.
You know, I put the coat on these handles about six hours ago, and I wiped it off, treating it like an oil finish because I didn't want it to be too shiny, but as it, even as it dries, I don't like it. I like the color when it was wet. I'm going to brush a coat of the varnish on here and leave it on, and uh, I'll worry about the sheen later. All right, this is dried overnight. Oh, that laminate's down fine. That worked great. I'm still a little unsure of what I'm going to do, but I have an idea. But the first step, in any case, is to clean it. I'm going to use my uh, uh, just a commercial degreaser that I like using and uh, give it a good cleaning. Boy, wouldn't it be great if it just uh, stayed the way it was looking when it was wet. Um, but it's not going to. I mean, this has some bad scratches in it. They're not coming out. Uh, you could make a case for maybe buying a piece of black laminate and re-laminating it. But anyway, I'm not going to do that. In the meantime, I'm going to try some uh, black shoe polish. Hopefully I have some. All right, I actually have some uh, black shoe polish. I do have my shoe polish kit from when I was a kid, and I do polish my shoes, but with brown. I don't have any black shoes. To give you an idea of how old this is, it still has a price tag on it, and it was 36 cents. It does look really good. Obviously, the scratches aren't going anywhere, but definitely, I like the sheen. Yeah, I think I'll, uh, I think I'll go ahead and do the whole top. I'm going to switch over to a white Scotch Brite pad. Just see how that works. All right, I'm going to let this. Uh, just dry overnight, and tomorrow I'll see what we got. And in the meantime, uh, the knobs are looking good. I want to give them another coat, a coat of satin. So I'm going to go over them really well with a Scotch Bite gray pad. Thinner. Wipe these off with a little bit of uh, paint thinner. Now this is the same tongue oil finish, but uh, it's a satin. Alright, these have dried overnight. <clears throat> these look good. I'm going to wax this one more time. I used the uh, shoe polish on it. And now I'm going to use this uh, bowling alley wax. I figure that's the uh, toughest wax I probably have and since this is the tabletop. That should work fine. I'll let this dry for a while and I'll uh, sort of buff it out again. It feels really smooth and it looks good. <clears throat> now, back to the handles and the saucepans. Now I'm going to rub these out with some uh, steel wool and polish, but first I want to install them. If you remember this large one, the, it doesn't have a screw in there. It never did because it's flat on one side, but it fit in there, but it's loose. So I've got to do something to tighten that up.
this is veneer scraps and I want something really thin I'll try this try a piece here to see if we're on the, the right track yeah maybe just a few of these I notice this little thing in here is loose. What the heck is that? It's a furniture glide. Okay, I think that's going to work well, so I'll, I'll redo it. I think I need maybe one more of a really skinny shim. You know, I was able to pull that out. I want to put it in, I want it to be so tight that I cannot pull it out. And of course, the screw goes in at the end, but I want it to be really tight. Just want to get this this wood under that lip. All right, that's uh. That worked out well. It's nice and tight. The small one, I don't think is an issue. It screws on. I just got to make sure that it lines up with the hole that's already in the bottom there. I want to uh, reinstall the top uh, with its base. A little bit of epoxy on the underside here. A little alcohol. Take off that remainder. So now we'll tackle the tray. Uh, first things, I gotta get these uh, stickers off. I still have the stickers on the bottom of here too. So on something like this, that's metal. Boy, they're really stuck on there. I'll try some of this uh, Goo Gone stuff. So let it soak for a little while. I don't know if it's soaking through the paper or not, but you can, you can move the liquid under the sticker here. Still left a bunch of adhesive here. I think the the goo gone will take it right off. Oh yeah. And of course another way to get stickers off is uh, with the good old heat gun. Just a little bit of residue left uh, after the heat, but most of it came off. And the stickers were hiding the Dansk label. Now these stickers are different.
Now I'm ready to move on to the uh, orange oil and beeswax polish. This piece is in pretty good shape, so I'm going to go over it with 4-0 steel wool in the polish. Let's see how it works on this tray. We'll let the oil sit on that for a little while. These little pink specks are maddening. I'll see if I can nick it. This one's coming out too. Oh, there we go. So there you go. These are just great you know, objects by some heavy hitter mid-century designers. Uh, picked them up for under 20 bucks at the local thrift stores. And uh, they're just beautiful and ready for years more of service. I think they look pretty good. I'm Tom Johnson, Thomas Johnson Antique Furniture Restoration in Gorm, Maine. This is a pair of chairs. These are designed by Hans Wagner. Uh, it's just called the Model JH-512 Folding Chair. I don't know if they have any other name. They were first designed, and, or I should say first produced, in 1949 by uh, Johannes Hansen. These chairs, these particular chairs, were purchased by the owner's grandfather, uh, new in 1965, at the Hans Wegener Atelier in Copenhagen. And like I said, they're folding chairs. They fold up, and then they're designed to hang on the wall. This little wishbone thing here. And you can see they're also uh, branded here. These chairs are in fair shape. Uh, the finish uh, obviously needs to be restored. All the reed work seems to be in pretty good shape. One of the seats has some broken areas. We'll see if we can repair them and bring this back to life. The main thing that's wrong is this wishbone arrangement is broken. The, this side of the piece is missing altogether and the other side is broken too. So we've got, first thing we've got to do is repair that and then we'll work on the finish and the read. All right, first thing we've got to do is get this uh, stretcher assembly out of here. So, you know, this, uh, the stretcher assembly is included here because it pivots in both places. So I think if I just uh, am able to spread this apart, uh, hopefully it'll pop out of there. forgot to mark this chair. And you know, as a little side note here, I believe that this thing, maybe it was repaired before and it was installed backwards because of the stamp. The other one 
was reversed, and I think that's the correct way. When the chair is in its folded position, here's the brand, and when the chair is like this, if you looked under here, here's the brand name, and that, I'm just sort of guessing that's the way it ought to be. This is kind of interesting actually. You can see uh, where the breaks occurred in both of these. There's a little bit of a short grain problem here. This one was glued before. You can see the old glue there, uh, but it failed. This one, they cut in new wood, put in a piece. Uh, it failed too. It's gone. And you can see where in addition to the short grain problem, the tenon that's through there has further weakened this whole area. So I think I'll need to cut a little bit deeper than the last person. This part is broken all the way here. Maybe I should go right about there. Uh, I'll cut away some of that tenon, but uh, that's a long tenon. There's plenty of tenon there. And maybe go back a little bit further. Hopefully that'll give it more strength. I've got some nice uh, kind of light teak here. I think that ought to do the job. Okay, looks good. I've got a, I'm, my angle here isn't square. I've got to, I got to angle this block a little bit. I 
think that's as close as I'm going to get it. Now I like to relieve this uh, inside corner just a skosh. I want to make sure that doesn't uh, hang me up. You know, teak is known as an uh, oily wood, although you know it's not not like rosewood or anything. But I'm still just going to give these uh, this joint a quick wipe of lacquer thinner, and I'll let the lacquer thinner flash off, and then I'll uh, glue it. I'm going to use tight bond here. I want to. I feel like it's probably stronger than hide glue, and I really am. Uh, concerned that this be as strong as possible. Give these a few minutes, let the glue so soak in a bit. Now I'll do the uh, exact same repair to the other one. these dry overnight.
got to keep going till I get to this one, the 5 8 Being very careful to try to keep this thing round. That's not bad. I think the, the sanding will bring that right in. Okay, this is uh, ready to be sanded with a hundred, but I think I'm going to do the other one first. I also, I don't think it's necessary to try this out and share. I'm pretty confident it's going to work. I'll do the other one, then we'll try them out. Yeah, it works fine. I'm going to uh, wash these down with a solution of clamp cutter and water. You know, I'm quickly realizing <clears throat> I want to take these chairs apart to clean. Not to mention the fact that I never finished sanding uh, my new wood. Now the teak looks good and the caning looks good when it's wet too, the reed I should say. These handles where people's hands uh, were are really dirty. That's why you need a cleaner that can really cut grease and oil. So this is what came off one chair. dry overnight. Okay, I've got to sand these now, but first uh, there's some pieces of the reed that are loose. Uh, space like this and this have popped up. Uh, and I've got some like instant type glue here I'm going to use to see if I can get those down. It seems to hold it down pretty well. And then also I'm going to try to try to reweave a little bit on one of the seats. Alright, I think that's enough of the uh, weaving repairs. Uh, I didn't do every single piece that's broken, but I did a few that I thought were key. Anyway, now I've got to sand, and I'm going to sand uh, everything with the 100 grit paper.
it's funny, I just noticed, <clears throat> I had not noticed before, that this, uh, this is the seat part. It had been broken and repaired before. There must be two screws in here. I'm just going to putty up this crack a little bit. Okay, I've got everything sanded, so now I'm going to apply some finish. Uh, I'll just use the Waterlox tongue oil varnish. I'll, I'll brush it on though, but wipe it off. I won't, you know, use it like an oil finish, not like a varnish. Now I'm going to coat the cane also, and I mean, uh, uh, normally I say cane reed. Uh, normally it doesn't need a finish. Cane and reed has its own hard finish. But what I noticed about this, the reason uh, that it looks so uh, I don't know, dull, is that the natural finish on this cane has worn off. And so uh, hopefully uh, the varnish will help bring it back its original color. Now, in my last video, I talked about uh, oily rags and the need to get them out of the shop. I didn't say why, though, and it's because these rags, when bundled up like this in, in an enclosed trash can, can spontaneously combust. And they will. It's happened. So I get all the oily rags, my brush, all these newspapers out of the shop. I like to lay them out outside so they dry. Some people put them in water. It doesn't matter what you do as long as they are out of the house. Okay, it's dried overnight. <clears throat> First, I'm going to do a little bit of touch-up work on my new wood. This is a medium brown walnut dye stain. Uh, thinned out. Thinned out a lot. Funny, this piece of teak has such a color change there. I'm going to give this uh, now another coat. I'm going to uh, apply it with a gray scotch bright pad, you know, just as a method of applying it, and, and also it'll just help smooth it out, although it certainly feels fairly smooth right now. But it kind of works the works the oil into it, gives it a better finish. You can sort of hear that little bit of scratchiness. I don't know if you can hear it or not, but you can also hear it uh, give way to the scotch Bright pad and become smoother. Now I'm just kind of patting this off, not like you know, really rubbing it all the way off there. I want to leave a little bit of build here. That first coat really soaked in. dry. Alright, everything's uh, dry, it looks good. I'm going to wax it now. I'm going to use a uh, Watco satin wax to wax these up. Once again, I'm not like rubbing it real hard. I'm kind of just going lightly here, trying to, you know, leave a little bit there on the surface. Yeah. 
you know, I'm thinking instead of trying to avoid the reed, I should just uh, go over it with a little wax. Okay, ready to reassemble. Just occurred to me I ought to polish them up a little bit. A little white vinegar seems to do the trick. So there you go, two uh, Hans Wegner JH-512 chairs. Uh, these were purchased new in 1965. Uh, we did a major repair on the stretcher assembly here. And then just uh, cleaned them and uh, sanded them, re-oiled them. Uh, this is the original uh, reed caning. I did uh, splice in some pieces here. Uh, I'm hoping that will help give it some strength. I'm not about to sit in these chairs to test this cane. It seems strong. The owner will find out as they start using them. I was trying to figure out why this piece broke where it did. I'm kind of trying to understand what stresses are going on here. And I have a theory. Uh, because these chairs belong to the presence owner grandfather, <clears throat> what I've seen uh, in my age group and uh, older people, I noticed this with my father-in-law particularly, that they were getting out of chairs using their arms. And since both stretchers were broken on the same side, it makes me think that when people are getting out of these chairs, <laughs> it's got handles right here, that they are pushing really hard. Maybe there are holes body strength on those. So granted this is harder. Here I go sitting in one. I'm not putting my weight back on it though. But you need to be able to get up without using your arms. That's why I think this broke. And hopefully that won't happen again. Anyway. I think they look pretty good. I'm Tom Johnson, Thomas Johnson Antique Furniture Restoration in Gorm, Maine. This is a nice set of six Paul Macabre dining chairs. Uh, they're number 432 from the Linear Group. Uh, Paul Macabre was a well-known designer. His work is represented in quite a few museums. He worked from the late 40s to the mid 60s. The finish, you know, in the catalogs I've looked at online, they describe the finish as a warm walnut. I don't see that in these chairs at all. They look more like a typical finish from that period that was like bleached and glazed. A lot of the wood, you can see it's walnut. Some of the wood, particularly the seat frames, don't look like walnut. One of the chairs has a darker color, more like a, a walnut. Maybe even you might describe as a warm walnut. So I don't really know what's, what's going on here. As we work on the chairs though, we'll get more hints as to what the original finish might have been. But I'm not going to change the finish much. I, there's some areas that are greatly deteriorated. 
that are going to need some work. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do to them yet. We'll figure that out as we go along. This is the only one of the six chairs that has these screws going through the seat like that into the leg. They all have these eyes with a screw. Boy, these screws don't uh, want to come out. I'm going to apply some heat to them. That's two minutes on medium. Boy, that screw does not want to move. So I'm thinking, well, maybe, maybe these back points don't need to come apart. They're pretty good. I thought they would just come apart. But maybe I can glue the stretchers and the back without taking them apart. The fact that uh, three of these structure joints came loose really makes me to want to get the fourth one here. I'll uh, apply a little heat to it. I think maybe I'll try loosening these corner screws, the screws that go through the eye, which is common to all the chairs, and maybe I'll be able to uh, make it a little bit easier to get to these stretchers. Man, these suckers are tight too. Gotta hope the screws isn't breaking. Yep. It's so rusted in there, it just broke. This side seems to be coming out though. All right, so I've just got to uh, try and drill that out. A brand new bit for the occasion. I think I'll use a larger bit. Uh, that way I can use that eye as a, you know, sort of be a guide to hold it in place. Now I'll go in with a quarter inch bit.
I think this is probably the best bet, but I'm going to uh, I'm going to replace this original one too. I'm really seeing how badly rusted it is. It's no wonder the other one broke. This one here is completely rusted out in this area here. The metal is gone. Okay, you know, I've noticed uh, as I've been working here trying to scrape that that this front leg is a little loose. I think I want to try to uh, pop this stretcher out of here to facilitate, uh, I can do a better job on this front leg. Alright, I'm going to glue it up. I'm going to use a uh, glue that's new to me. It's a pre-mixed hide glue called Old Brown Glue. It seems really sturdy. All right, now we'll uh, tackle an armchair. This is so interesting under here. Uh, you know, you can tell so much if you turn a piece of furniture over. Uh, this wood, which I assume is walnut, it doesn't look like walnut. It's so light in color. This chair must have been, all this furniture must have been heavily bleached at the factory. And then here's the uh, glaze that they used. You can see evidence of it. And these chairs have never been refinished uh, as far as anyone knows, so uh, that must be original. Boy, this is a relief. There's something strange about that first chair. When a little chip out like this occurs, when I was pulling that out, it's important to glue that back where it belongs right away.
Now note, I'm, uh, I'm marking every joint, even though it's completely obvious as to which arm goes where, you should mark a piece up as if someone else is going to put it back together. Wow, look at that. Someone had run a dowel from underneath up at an angle into that joint. And now, look what you've got. If I could just do a quick little rant here. People often ask in the comments section, after I've glued something back together, geez, why didn't you run a dowel through there or put a screw in there or something? And sometimes I might do that, but it is way overrated and serves more often to weaken, especially if it's in, a, in an area where there's joinery involved, more often it's, you know, superfluous, or not, not even superfluous, it actually weakens the joint. This piece is not going to come out of there. I will leave it there and uh, when I glue the leg back, I'll glue that. But I can still glue up uh, this bit right now. Now I just have a lot of uh, scraping to do on all these joints. Boy, aren't we glad we marked everything. You know, it's funny, I just realized I was going to leave these, uh, these dowels that someone angled in there. I was going to leave them. But then I just realized I, I can't put the legs back on. I, they, they broke taking them off. Uh, I've got to trim those off. Good, now it freed up that sliver so I can glue it back where it belongs. It doesn't look like walnut, does it?
Well, that was quite the uh, frantic little glue up there. It's always tough when you're gluing an entire chair and then to be using a uh, sort of time sen sensitive glue and be videotaping yourself all at the same time makes for an exciting glue up. Wow, this, uh, this chair is solid. So I'm going to glue up the other chairs uh, off camera. If something unusual comes up, I'll, I'll video that. And in the meantime, um, I've got two chairs glued up. Uh, we can start working on the finish. All right, now we can uh, begin the touch-up process. And I'm going to concentrate on these two chairs, which have the worst problems. Uh, here. On this arm, the finish is really flaking a lot. Uh, it's all, the arms are very dirty, you know, from people's arms. And uh, in this area, the finish is uh, really deteriorated, similar to this chair, which has some really bad uh, deterioration. Looks like sun damage. You can see bleached out here too. Uh, but the first step, always, is to clean these. And I'm going to use uh, my favorite cleaner crud cutter. It's a degreaser, which uh, is really important. These arms, you especially want to get all uh, oil and any other uh, contaminants off the chairs. Typically, I'll mix the crud cutter, uh, one part crud cutter to ten parts water. And I like using hot water. You see how all that discoloration disappeared when it was wet, and that's a really good sign. Same thing on this front rail. Boy, whatever that black mark is, it doesn't seem to be coming off. It looks like something dripped on there. I'm just not sure if there's anything you can do about that. That's what came off those two chairs. Not bad. This is probably the worst area on uh, all the chairs. I'm just going to pat a little uh, lacquer thinner on it. Just kind of want to see what happens. Yeah, the lacquer thinner seems like it might have uh, dissolved the finish a little bit and, and smoothed it out. Uh, I believe this is compatible uh, with lacquer. Probably is a nitrocellulose lacquer finish on there. That's what I would judge by the way the finish looks and the age of it. And so I'll be able to respray this with my uh, acrylic aerosols. So first I'll sand lightly with a little 320 gold.
Now I know it seems like a, I sprayed a lot on this chair, almost like I'm spraying the whole chair, but I'm not. You know, the crest rail is fine, a lot of it's fine. And most of the other chairs, I don't, I think, need hardly any aerosol at all. There's just a few bare spaces. I'll be able to polish those up, and I'll polish this one up when all this uh, lacquer dries. Okay, I uh, finished spraying all the places where there was raw wood with the uh, lacquer aerosol. Let everything dry overnight. Now I'll go over the entire chairs with my uh, favorite beeswax polish. And, um, and even though I cleaned these chairs, I still will just go over with a little steel wool. I guess just have it. Wow, so there you go. A nice set of Paul Macabre dining chairs. Uh, six chairs, two armchairs, which is nice. Uh, these are number 432 from the Linear Collection. And they needed, you know, as you remember, they needed a lot of regluing. And then the finish was pretty badly damaged in some areas. And so I spot finished, I cleaned and spot finished those areas, like the arms, uh, some of the uh, stretchers. One of them had a lot of damage on the side here. And all of them needed uh, lacquer on the feet, you know, the very, the very bottom of the legs. Could have made a case for refinishing them, but I decided to clean them and wax them, and the polish worked really well. They look great. They're all original. I have about 15 hours in this job, and uh, well, I think they look pretty good. I'm Tom Johnson, Thomas Johnson Antique Furniture Restoration in Gorm, Maine. These are the tambour doors of a mid-century modern rosewood bar cabinet. And you'll see the entire cabinet when I reinstall these in the customer's home. I don't know why they're called tambour doors, except the word tambour always involves things that are round, like think like a tambourine, for instance. But what's happened here is the material has deteriorated and needs to be replaced. The first thing I'm going to do is get a sheet of MDF, that's medium density fiberboard. I want to cut a piece to create a flat surface to do this work on. I'm going to cover this with wax paper to keep glue off of it. I gotta get this handle off. I've gotta pry this board off. And actually before I pry this board off, I'm gonna mill up the boards to hold this into place. And I'll wrap it out those boards to accommodate the, the tongues on the door.
Okay, I'm going to screw these down, but I've got to get this end board off first. Yeah, this keeper was glued down. That's unusual in my experience. So I was uh, getting a little tired of scraping it. I tried a little heat with the heat gun, but that really didn't seem to do too much. Uh, so what I've done here is I've laid a wet towel on the uh, fabric uh, just for five minutes. Yeah, I don't, the water didn't really seem to want to penetrate this much. But uh, as you can see, uh, some of it's ripping up anyway. I'm not sure, I don't think the water had anything to do with that. I don't want to soak it down because it'll just make a big mess and the other side of these is finished and water would creep down.
This is a uh, heavy linen fabric uh, we call mattress ticking. I had also cut a second piece of MDF covered with wax paper that will fit in here on top of the fabric. I just want to, it's not absolutely necessary to do this, but I want to ensure that this is flat. You can use any type of uh, water soluble glue. Okay, I'll let that dry overnight. Well, okay, uh, let's see what we got. All right, this, uh, this went down uh, nice and flat. Just a quick note about the gloves I've been wearing. I anticipate I'd get comments on that, just like people used to comment all the time on the bandages I had on my fingers. You know, it's about, there's a high of 22 degrees today. Uh, for my metric fans, that's minus 5. Humidity is 25, 30%. And the cold shop, uh, the cold tools, uh, was just killing the skin on my hands. So I, as much as I can, I'm keeping these gloves on, moisturize my hands. I'll show you. Just trying to keep them that way.
Okay, uh, let this dry overnight. On the second door, I was uh, I actually did a much better job of cutting the fabric and, and, uh, and fitting it here. This is a little bit off, so I'm going to trim up these edges a bit. Alright, these are the boards that go on the inside of the doors, uh, you know, to which the, right on the inside center edge. I've got to clean them down and reattach them. Well, this glue just does not want to scrape off. Uh, I tried the heat, really seemed to have no effect, which was my experience on the tambours themselves, which ultimately didn't matter. Uh, but what I've done here is uh, soaked a little vinegar on it, and that seems to be working fine. Okay, let's uh, let's see what we got. Oh yeah, this is great. Okay, I've got to reinstall these uh, strips on the inside of the doors. They were originally glued and nailed, but I'm going to uh, screw them down. Okay, now I will uh, get my kit and go to the customer's house to install these. Okay, here I am in the customer's home. Got a well-stocked cabinet here. Uh, we took the doors out from the front, but they were in pieces. I'm not sure if they're going to go back in or not. Uh, we're going to find out. The first thing I'm going to do is vacuum these tracks uh, just to get any dust or anything out of there. And now I'll wax these tracks as best I can. I really can't get to in the back or anything. And I'll also wax uh, the doors, you know, the, these uh, uh, tongues, if you will, that, are, that go in the slot. So this opening of the cabinet is not a, a perfect square. The top and bottom are curved. So there's a much larger dimension here in the center than there. 
we were able to pull them out through the center, but they were in pieces. So let's see if it will go back now that it's all together. space available to me. I'm not sure how this is going to work. Oh, I just realized this was kind of stuck there. Something was holding it up, but obviously it opens all the way. And so now I have the room to do this. Now I'm going to go over the uh, cabinet with my orange oil beeswax polish. So there you have it. This is a really nice mid-century modern rosewood bar cabinet uh, made in the 1960s by Mobler. And, uh, and it was fine, except the fabric had deteriorated on the back of these tambours. And now it's fine. I spent about uh, eight hours on this job. That includes pickup and delivery. And uh, these are the tools I used. I think it looks pretty good. I hope you liked the video, and if you did, please subscribe and like, and be sure to hit the bell icon so that you'll be notified when I put out a new video.